some mini solar storms on their way to Earth could give us a bumpy ride, and a ring of fire not seen in over a decade is lighting up the Western Hemisphere. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week remains in the moderate range. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view. On top of that, we have a few filaments as well. In fact, back on the 29th near center disk, whoosh, you can see a filament eruption right there. That is a solar storm that we are dealing with right now, but it, because it's pretty small, it's only been giving us unsettled conditions. And that's kind of the name of the game here. In fact, region 3449 and 3450, back on the 1st and the 2nd, they launch these very wispy solar storms that look like they're going to go to the east and the west of us. And that's not going to give us all that much either, but it could give us a bit of a bumpy ride. Then an area just below region 3455, pow, right there on the second, it launches a bigger solar storm. This one is clearly going to miss us to the east, but we might get a little bit of wake from that solar storm as well. So once again, nothing's really firing straight, straight in the line of Earth. And then finally on the third, whoosh, an area just above region 3449 launches a, a filament eruption. That's going to be a solar storm mainly going to the west of us. So man, we're just not seeming to get hit by these solar storms. However, if you take a look at the east limb, you can see a lot of action going on in the far side. This means we do have the potential for bigger solar storms to rotate, you know, the solar storm producers rather, that will rotate into Earth view and give us possibly bigger shows starting sometime next week. But for right now, it looks like things are going to stay pretty much in that moderate range. Now, switching to our far-sided sun, we can't use Stereo A imagery right now because Stereo A is no longer looking at the sun's far side. So we switched to AIA and HMI imagery from about two weeks ago to get an idea of what's lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look at the disk from about two weeks ago, we see old region 3425 as well as region 3435 and 45. These were all regions that were giving us some solar flare activity as well as solar storm activity. And as we take a look at the HMI helioseismology farsighted uh, viewer, we definitely see from those dark regions that those uh, active regions are still alive and well. So these could be the reasons why we're seeing some of those big solar storms being launched. And if these regions continue to survive their farsighted passage, we definitely could see solar flares ramp up just a little bit and big solar storms again here in about, oh, probably about five to seven days, especially because that's when old region 3435 and region 3445 will rotate back into Earth view. And those regions, I think, are going to be the big players to watch. It's been over 11 years since the Western Hemisphere saw a ring of fire during the last annular eclipse in May 2012. Now the sun and moon have partnered again to bring us another show. On October 14th, nearly the entire Western Hemisphere, including all of Canada, the USA, Mexico, Belize, Panama, central and northern parts of South America, even Greenland and the western edge of Africa will get a chance to catch a glimpse of this spectacular event. The show will begin with a shadow of the moon appearing over Alaska near local sunrise at 1503 UTC on October 14th. It will then travel eastward over the coast of Oregon and down across the central United States, passing through San Antonio, Texas, the last major city before exiting the USA. It will then drop further down to Mexico on its way to Panama before moving steadily southeast through Colombia and finally cutting across Brazil all the way to its east coast before the sun finally sets there at 2055 UTC. For those watching online, the solar eclipse will peak at 1759 UTC and last nearly six hours in total. 
If you plan to watch the eclipse in person, be sure to equip yourself with the proper safety glasses or specialized viewing equipment. Never look directly at the sun or use binoculars to view the eclipse unless they are specially designed for solar events. But if you are looking for a very unique way to experience the eclipse, walk over to hamsci.org because they'll be hosting a solar eclipse QSO party during the event. So be sure to check out their website and see how you can participate. With Hamsi, not only will you be able to see the eclipse, but you'll actually be able to hear its effects and experience firsthand how space weather generated during a solar eclipse can dramatically affect radio communications here at Earth. This will give you an entirely new perspective of what weather truly means in the 21st century and how it affects our modern world. But above all, stay safe and have fun. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, and by the 7th, the moon will still be about 41% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, you're going to have this bright companion. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are expecting to get continued hits from these mini solar storms over the next couple days because there have just been so many solar storm launches, little tiny ones, but they aren't expected to give us any huge deal, but it is enough to keep us on our toes. In fact, at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to minor storm conditions, but we do have up to about a 55% chance of a major storm, and that will happen around the 5th and then kind of settle down as we move into the 6th and the 7th. And then things should be reasonably quiet as we move into that weekend. However, at mid-latitudes, the story is a little bit calmer. We are expecting only unsettled conditions throughout the week, but we do have about a 15% chance of a minor storm. Again, it should be peaking around the 5th, and but by the 6th, things should be calming back down. So Aurora photographers, if you're at mid-latitudes, maybe not so much of a show, but high latitudes, you could definitely get a chance. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view, and a few of them are big flare players, and that is boosting that solar flux. We're staying well into the 160s over this week. We could even see a little bit of a climb as some of those regions from the sun's far side begin to rotate into Earth view. We are also sitting at about a 40% chance of uh, M-class flares. That, at, that's at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout. So we we will be having moderate noise on the bands, and this will easily extend in through the weekend uh, because we've got those new regions that will rotate into view. We might even begin to pop up yet into higher ranges. It's just hard to tell, but expect us to have moderate noise on the bands. In fact, we do have even a 5% chance of an X-class flare. That's at an R3 level radio blackout, and that's also going to contend uh, throughout this entire week. Now, as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation, outlook over the coming week? Well, we actually are sitting at the D1 normal range. This is for you aviators, and this is at flight level 360, and you notice everything is in the green. We are sitting also at the S0 level. That's the quiet range, and it does look like this is going to continue throughout this week. It doesn't look like any of these big flare players are big enough to give us strong radiation storms. However, as a few of them begin to rotate to the sun's west limb, you'll see near the end of the week that radiation storm risk will rise likely from about 5%, which is where we are right now, to a 10% chance of getting an S1 to S2 level radiation storm. So aviators, everything is in the green right now, and you frequent flyers, none of you have to worry about things. But as we get to the end of this upcoming week, begin to pay a little bit more attention because we could see a bigger rise in chance for radiation storms. So the space weather this week remains in the moderate range. We are going to be continually hit by these mini solar storms, especially over the next few days, when that could bring us a bit of a bumpy ride. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show, and that should peak right around the 5th or the 6th. But Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, the Aurora is going to be a bit more fleeting, so only if you're dedicated should you chase.
Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we're sitting with solar flux well into the triple digits, and that's great news when it comes to radio propagation on Earth's day side. But we do have moderate noise on the bands right now and a decent risk for radio blackouts, especially at the R1 to R2 level. And as we move to the weekend, that risk might actually increase. So that means the noise on the bands might actually increase. So enjoy uh, the quiet when you have it. Now, GPS users, well, you know, things aren't looking too bad for you. We do have those mini solar storms that are going to hit, but they probably aren't going to give us all that much disturbance. So not going to worry too much about Aurora unless you're at high latitudes. And then the radio blackouts, well, it's not too bad. We're getting mostly C-class flares, not even in the big R1 to R2 levels. So, you know, enjoy that because that means uh, that you're not getting too many disruptions even at dawn and dusk. But I can't say that next week will be any better. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.